and try the six-step procedure. Question. So this six-step procedure says, hey, let's start out. The first thing I've been doing with all of these is finding the what? Okay, we want to find the domain. Now, the domain is the set of possible inputs. And the reason that it matters is because there's some things that you're not allowed to have with rational functions, right? And so basically what we say is the denominator cannot equal zero, right? That's something we know. And so I'm going to go ahead and say, well, what would happen if I had the denominator equal to zero? All right, I'm going to go ahead and solve this equation to find what x is not allowed to equal. Because again, x cubed plus x squared minus 2x is not allowed to be 0. And I'll put that just to kind of emphasize. We're not allowed to have it equal to 0. So the way to figure out what, how it doesn't equal 0 is say, well, what would make it equal 0, right? And so what do I want to do here? We want to factor out an x, right? Because one of the answers is going to be that maybe x is 0. That's no good, right? So if I factor out x, I'd have x squared plus x minus 2, right? And so if I continue factoring, well, this factors really nicely. It gets x plus 2 here, and I get x minus 1. So when we say that the denominator is not allowed to equal 0, what we're saying is that x is not allowed to be 0, also what? X is not allowed to be what? Negative 2. And X is not allowed to be 1. Okay? So here is the domain. The domain, I guess if I list it in interval notation, I'm going to go from negative infinity to, well, I guess the first one of these things I would hit is negative 2. Right? And then I'm going to go from negative 2 to 0, and I'm going to go from 0 to 1, and then I'm going to go from 1 to infinity. Okay, so that's my domain. Next. The second step, it says to reduce the fraction if possible, all right? So I want to point out that what I can do is I can rewrite f of x equals x, well, first of all, can I factor that numerator? Sure. I already factored the denominator. I figured out it was x times x plus 2 times x minus 1. What about the numerator? Yeah, it's x minus 1 times itself, right? There we go. That's the numerator. That's the denominator. Okay? Now, is this true? Is it true that f of x equals this? I'm going to say it's almost true. And the reason I'm going to say it's almost true is if you were to graph these two graphs, they would look almost identical. You probably wouldn't be able to tell them apart. Except, I want you to think that about the domain of the function written here in blue. Is the domain different? How come? X is allowed to equal... 1 for the blue function, but f of x is not allowed to equal 1 for the black function. Does that make sense? What's that? So there's going to be a hole in the graph where? At 1, well, we'll have to figure out where, I guess you said 0. Yeah, 1, 0. Because if I were to compute, so, so I'm going to say this. f of x equals this 
this function, that's true on this domain. All right? So you compute the domain, domain before you do reducing. Otherwise, you've actually changed the function. You'll lose that hole in the graph. Okay? So what I would say is, yes, we already know that f of x has a hole at x equals 1. And now what I can do is I can take the reduced version and I can, you know, ask what, what would the output be? Well, if I throw in a 1 for the x, I get 1 minus 1 in the numerator. And in the denominator, I get something, let's see, I get 1 times 1 plus 2. So I'm going to get 0 over 1 times 3, and that's 0. So when I say f of x has a hole at x equals 1, by using the reduced fraction and putting my 1 in for x, I can compute that actually the hole is at 1 comma 0. My picture. Does, does this make sense to people? Okay. So that's what they say is the second step. Go ahead and find the reduced version. Okay? Now, step three it says, let's find x and y intercepts. Find x and y intercepts. So, Let's see. How do I do that? Well, to find, hmm, which one's easier? The y-intercepts are easier, right? I'll do that first. If I want to find the y-intercepts, what I do is I set what equal to 0? Set x equal to 0, right? And so I would compute f of 0. Oh, wait a minute. Hang on one sec. Okay, when I draw my graph, I have an x-axis and a y-axis. Right now, I decided I'm going to find which kind of intercept? The y-intercept, right? So we're looking for a point somewhere on this line. Are you guys with me? What's the equation, for example, of this point right here, if I go up 1? What's the, what's, the, what's the coordinates of this point, I guess? Isn't that 0, 1? What about this one? 0, 2, right? What's true about all the points that could be y-intercepts? Well, x is 0. Does this make sense, Augusto? Okay, so that's why I set x equal to 0. So I really do this. Okay? You guys with me? Now, f of 0 is, oh, wait a minute. Look at that top equation. I get 0 squared minus 0 plus 1 over 0 cubed plus 0 squared minus 0. What's the deal? 1 over 0 is what? Undefined. So do I have any y-intercepts? No. As a matter of fact, what will I have when I have this situation about something over 0? We're going to have an asymptote, aren't we? What kind of asymptote? This is a vertical asymptote, right? The reason I don't have any y-intercepts is because I'm actually going to have an asymptote right there. Do you guys follow? Okay. How do I know it's a vertical asymptote? Any time that I get a zero in the denominator, but something non-zero in the numerator, I know I'm going to have a vertical asymptote there. Matter of fact, remember when we did this equation about the domain here? Where else do you think we might have a vertical asymptote? We 
have one at x equal, x equals 0. Where else am I going to have one? Well, x equals 1 is also a place that the function is undefined, right? But I claim that at x equals 1, we are going to have a whole. What's different about when I compute f of 1? Well, I could do it, right? If I compute f of 1, I would get 1 squared minus 2 times 1 plus 1 over 1 cubed plus 1 squared minus 2 times 1. So I'm putting a 1 in. And now what do I get? Well, that numerator is 0 and the denominator is 0. You guys see that? Now, why did that happen? Well, remember, one of the first things we did was we factored and then we saw that we had this common factor here and here. Remember this? And that's why I got 0 over 0. And that's the situation where you're going to have a hole in the graph. And where is that hole in the graph, we said? 1, 0. So there's going to be a hole in the graph right there. I'm going to go ahead and put that there right now. Okay? Now, one other thing to do, and that is uh, f of what? Yeah, let's do f of negative 2. And if we do f of negative 2, I get negative 2 squared minus 2 times negative 2 plus 1, all over negative 2 cubed uh, plus negative 2 squared minus 2 times negative 2. Hey, guys, I'm going to tell you, I already know the denominator gives me 0, right? That was the first thing I did was I, when I did the domain calculation, I said, well, what happens, right? What, what, make, what would make it 0? Well, negative 2 would. You can check that if you want. But in the numerator, it looks like I'm getting 4 plus 4 is 8 plus 1 is 9. I'm getting something besides 0. What does that say is going to happen at x equals negative 2? We're going to have a vertical asymptote, so I better draw that. So let's see. 1, 2. Okay. Zooming in a little bit so we can see a little better. One thing that didn't happen yet is I didn't find the x-intercepts. Hmm. Now, how do I find the x-intercepts? Set what equal to 0? The whole equation, the function equal to 0. Set f of x equal to 0. Really? OK. Let me move back up top here and talk about it. I'm going to do it in orange. If I set the whole equation equal to 0, right, or even the original equation, how do you make a function that's a rational equation, a fraction equal to 0? How do we make a fraction equal to 0? Which part do I have to make equal 0? The numerator, right? If I make the denominator equal to 0, what happens? It's undefined. But I want to see if anything makes the numerator equal to 0. Well, in this example, what's the only thing that would make the numerator equal to 0? 1. But 1 is where there's a hole in the graph. You see that? That would be an x-intercept, but it's not in my domain. So there are no x-intercepts for this problem. But normally, you'd have to look and see what makes the numerator equal to 0. OK. So step four, determine the location of vertical asymptotes or holes. We just did this. Step five, analyze the end behavior of R. Find horizontal or slant, slant asymptote if one exists. All right. This is the other question you guys were asking me about is, how do you compute the horizontal asymptotes? This is what Stephanie and Jenna, a couple of you guys were asking. All right, take this problem, guys. I want to think about end behavior. Okay, So I want to look at what happens as x goes to infinity. So I'll write it down here. 
end behavior. Let's look at the limit as x goes to infinity of, well, x squared minus 2x plus 1 over x cubed plus x squared minus 2x. Now, I told you that to analyze this, really the only terms that matter are the highest degree terms. Do you know what I mean by that? Which parts matter? The x cubed matters and the x squared matters. You guys with me? And the reason that's true is because if I, let's say I put in a really big number like 10. I don't know if that's really big. But let's, that's big. That's right, to the right. If I put in 10, what's the numerator approximately? Well, 100 minus 20, so it's about 100. What's the denominator approximately if I put in 10? 1,000. So I have like 100 over 1,000. That's a fraction. That's a small fraction. Here, let me put in a number that's larger. Let's put in 1,000, because what's 1,000 squared? What's 1,000 squared? A million, right? So if I put in 1,000, I would have, so let's let x equal 1,000 for a minute. If I, the numerator is basically 1 million, but what's the denominator? Huge is correct. How huge? Very, very large, 1 billion, right? And so what I'm going to tell you is that as x gets really big, if the degree of the denominator is larger, then this limit is going to go towards zero. Right? Zero. And so I claim we're going to have an asymptote right here. y equals zero, or maybe we should call it f of x equals zero, right? That's the horizontal asymptote. So it really depends on the function. Why is it zero? Well, it is. But 1 million over 1 billion is close to zero. If you put in a million, you're going to get a trillion over something even larger. It's going to keep getting closer and closer to zero. And by the way, the same thing would be true if I put in negative infinity. I'm going to have this same situation. Okay? So your horizontal asymptote for this function is going to be at y equals 0. That's what asymptote means. So when the power is bigger on the bottom, like number 6 or number 8, we know we have an asymptote at y equals 0. But what about number 10? If I put in a big number like 1,000, what's the numerator approximately? Wouldn't it be 3 million? Are you guys with me? What would the denominator be? 1 million minus 9. That's around 1 million. Are you guys with me? What's 3 million over 1 million? That's about 3. So pretty much what happens is the leading coefficients, if the degree is the same, they tell me what the function is going to approach. And it's going to be y equals 3. You guys see that? It's the coefficients, that's right. If they're the same, it's the coefficients. Number two is a little tricky. I didn't assign that one to start. What would the horizontal asymptote be? Well, I put in 1,000. The numerator is pretty much 5,000. The denominator is about negative 2,000. Do you see what it's going to approach? It would be 5,000 over 2,000 with a negative. Negative 5 halves is my horizontal asymptote. Okay? Yeah, oh, we should do that. We should do that. When I look here, okay, problem three, horizontal asymptote would be at zero. Y equals zero. How come? 
Yeah, the power of the denominator is bigger. Problem number six, this one has a slant asymptote. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Problem number nine, horizontal asymptote where? Y equals one. Y equals one. Problem number 12, slant asymptote. I'll talk about that, but it's because the degree is one higher in the numerator than it is in the denominator. Problem 15, slant asymptote. We'll talk about that one too. Problem 18, well, no wonder you didn't learn horizontal asymptotes yet. You didn't have enough examples. Here, let's go back to one that has a horizontal asymptote. Can you find one? Nine? Yeah, nine, we had y equals one. How about one of these other problems? Problem one. Problem one has a horizontal asymptote because the degree is the same. Now, if I put in a thousand, I get a thousand over approximately what? 3,000, right? Just forget about the minus 6. And what's 1,000 over 3,000? One third. Now, when you put in f of 1,000, it doesn't actually equal one third because there's that little minus 6. But we would have a, a horizontal asymptote at y equals one third for this function. You guys follow? Any questions on that? Mitch? That's what I tell people to do, sure. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's right. And now, I haven't talked about slant asymptotes. I will later. But, I mean, I did, did last time once. But, but I've got to show you another example. But it has to be where the top has degree one higher than the others. If it's more than that, you won't even see a slant asymptote. All right. Mitch? You have the same power on the top and bottom and there's no room There's always one there. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, like even here, in the very first problem, number one, the bottom one has a coefficient of three. The top one has a coefficient of one, even though we don't write it. So it's one over three. It's whatever that ratio is. All right. I'd like to finish the problem. Does these take forever, don't they? I mean, that, you can see why I assigned six. I'm like, that's enough. You know? Okay. So back to this problem that we're working on here. Let's see. Um, we have a lot of asymptotes drawn. We haven't drawn the function yet. Okay? And that's because I want to do step six. And step six says... Hey, let's do a sine diagram. Okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is, instead of just drawing the graph, I'm also going to draw a number line. Okay? So this is my sine diagram. This is the last step, step six of doing problem number 16. When I do the sign diagram, the first thing I do is I identify important points on the graph. So what points do I have so far that are important? Well, I guess, let's see. Negative 2 is important because we know there's an asymptote there. What else is important? 0. 0 is important. Okay? And... One is important, right? And the reason I say that those points are important is because, well, we know that the graph is undefined at any of these points. At any of these points. Okay? I need a little more room, so I'm going to jump ahead to the next page and start again. Now, so what your book does when they do a sign diagram, I kind of like. They say, well, let's put the points we know. So we know that at negative 2 and at 0 and at 1, we have some interesting things. Okay? 
they put a little exclamation point, I guess, saying, hey, interesting things are happening at these points. At two of them, we have an asymptote, and at the one, we have a, um, a hole in the graph, right? Okay, so now next, what we want to do is we want to pick <coughs> test points in each interval. Okay, so we have, again, the function is f of x equals, I'm going to go ahead and show you what I mean, f of x equals, well, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and write the factored form, because we factored it, remember? We had x minus 1 times x minus 1 over x times x plus 2 times x minus 1. That's the function. And I think it's kind of nice to think about it as that. Or if I want to, I remember I reduced, I canceled these. Okay? And as long as I account for the hole in the graph at 1, I'm okay. So now what I'll do is I'll compute f of x for certain values. So let's try a value um, to the left of negative 2. Let me try f of what? Negative 3 would be fine. If I do f of negative 3, I get negative 3 minus 1 over negative 3 times negative 3 plus 2. Question. Yeah, you know what? It's not going to matter. And let me show you why. Okay? Yeah. The reason it doesn't matter is because think about if you put it in. You'd get, let me do it here in red. Negative 3 minus 1, and you get negative 3 minus 1, right? But if I want to, I can go ahead and cancel those. That's what I figure. So, but it's good to understand it, too. So I'm glad you're asking. So let me see what I get. I get negative 4 over what? Negative 3 times negative 1, right? But I'll be honest with you. I already wrote too much and did too much thinking. Because I, I don't really care what it equals. All I really care about for a sine diagram is the sign. Is it positive or negative? That's what I care about. Now look what I'm doing, right? I'm taking a negative, and I'm dividing by, well, a negative times a negative. So what am I doing? I'm taking a negative number, and I'm dividing by a positive number, because two negatives makes a positive. And then when I do negative divided by positive, I get negative. Now, I want to tell you, there's nothing special about the number negative 3. If I had picked negative 4, I'd still get a negative. If I pick negative 5, I still get a negative. And that tells me something. It tells me that, guys, the graph, of the function to the left of negative 2 is going to be negative. Negative over here. So on the picture, I already have an idea that the sketch looks something like this. Guys follow? All right. Let's do the others. So we need to split it up here. I'd like um, everybody in the back row to pick a point between 0 and negative 2. Everybody in the middle row, the second row from the back, pick a point between 0 and 1. Everyone in the front row or the second row here, pick a number greater than 1. And all I want to know is the sign for each of those situations. You're going to get the same result I do. Because when I do f of a million, I get, remember, all I care about is the sign. Positive over positive times positive. Same thing you got when you did 3 or 5 or whatever you did. You got positive. Am I right? Am I sure? Positive. All right. What about f of 1 half? Well, in the numerator, oh, a half minus 1, that's negative. 
in the denominator, don't I get positive, positive? And so I'm going to say f of 1 half is negative. Is that what you guys got? Second row, you coming through? We agree? All right, back to the last row. What did you guys get for the negative one? Negative over negative times positive. Because when I put in a negative 1 plus 2, that ends up being positive. And so negative over negative is positive. Okay, so what's this all mean? Well, let's go up here and take a quick look at my drawings. And I see that the sine diagram that corresponds to the graph, I can fill in now. It's this number line. And that number line is going to help me get an idea of what the graph looks like of the function. So watch. I have vertical asymptotes at negative 2 and 0, and I know that the function is positive. So seems to me the picture is going to be something like this. Okay? I know that I have negative when I'm to the left of the hole and positive when I'm to the right of the hole. I also know that these are asymptotes, so it has to approach that line. And so it's going to do this kind of thing. But then it has to approach this line. And so this is an interesting graph. It shows you a, an example of a function that actually crosses the line that's going to be its asymptote. Although there's a hole there, too, in the graph we figured out. All right. Last step for this problem. It's, it, they gave me this hint in the footnote. It said, hey, after you do this picture, then go ahead and see what happens on the graphing calculator. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and try this. So first of all, we go to the y equals screen, and I want to graph the function. It's x squared minus, uh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, we better put it in parentheses or we're going to mess it up. Help me out. Where it is? Oh, we go. x squared minus 2x plus 1. Divided by, and then we want x cubed. Oh, that didn't work. x cubed, and then what? Come on, guys, help me out. Plus x squared, and then what? Minus 2x. Okay. So we want to see a graph. So I'm going to just do the standard graph and just kind of see, does this look at all like what I was talking about? Well, yeah. It kind of does. Okay? Although it didn't seem to come up very high, but maybe that's why they say to check it out on the window. Let's see. So the window they tell me to use is from where to where? 0, 12 for the x's. All right, let me try that. x min is 0. x max is 12. y min is 0. And y max is 0.25. And let's graph. Oh, okay. Now, what piece of it is, that, is it graphing right now? It's graphing this little tiny feature over here, okay? Kind of showing me that, hey, there is a relative, do you remember what this was called? Or a local maximum here. Now, knowing exactly where that is, I can't show you that today. This is not going to happen. I'll help you guys with this. By the way, one thing that you want to do right away with any rational function is you want to talk about the domain. And I know I could write it out with interval notation, right? But I guess what's most important is you say, what is x not allowed to equal? x is not allowed to equal what in number 1? Negative 4. Because if you had negative 4, 
you'd have a zero in the denominator. So my domain, I guess, is given by negative infinity, negative 4, union, negative 4, infinity. Okay? So that's a little idea of what's happening. Okay? And uh, did anyone use the graphing calculator and sketch a graph of number 1? Can I see? Oh, yeah. It's what? It's just a line. But I, then you start thinking your calculator's broken, right? Because wait a minute. Is this really a line? Well, almost. Yeah. So, so watch what we do. We say, well, let's talk about f of x. And you know, you guys have these instincts, because you've taken so many algebra classes, that you just automatically, when you see that numerator, you just have the urge to do what? Yeah, what do I want to write? I, I just want to write x plus 4 times x minus 4, right? So I do. I write x plus 4 times x minus 4. And then I look at it, and what? Yeah, uh, am I allowed to cancel the x plus 4s? Well, kind of. I claim that if I canceled the x plus 4s, I would get this function in red. Are you with me? Sure. Is g of, a, is g of x the same function as f of x? Well, almost. The graph is the same. I guess what's different is, what's the domain for g of x? All real numbers, right? I mean, when you graph a line, back when you take algebra, whatever, 1, or beginning algebra, you go down to negative 4, and you have a slope of 1, and you don't ever think about the domain at all, right? You just graph a line. And this is what it looked like on the calculator when I tried to graph f of x. But the point is, is that x is not allowed to equal what? Negative 4. By the way, is x allowed to equal negative 4 here in g? Sure. What is g of negative 4? Well, it's negative 4 minus 4 more would be negative 8, right? And so for the graph of g, you have it well defined. But for the graph of f, you don't, right? I mean, if I tried to do it, if I tried to do f of negative 4, I would get 0 in the denominator. You guys with me on that? But I would also get 0 in the numerator. Do you see that? Okay. And in calculus, this is called an indeterminate form. It means we may have a hole in the graph. That's right. This is the situation where we get a hole in the graph, right? Because f of x has exactly the same graph as g of x. I'm going to draw the graph of f in blue. The only difference is there's a hole where? Right here. At... What point? Negative 4, comma, negative 8. And so this is what the book's talking about when they talk about a hole in the graph, is that when you have a factor that can be canceled, the x plus 4s, you're going to have a situation where, well, it's not defined, but if it were defined there, we would want it to look like g. And that's going to be a hole in the graph. So I guess I would label that's my hole in the graph. Um, do I have any asymptotes at all for problem one? No, I don't. Okay. So that's why the directions are kind of vague, I think. Which is why I didn't let you struggle with it for very long. It's time to just do it. All right. Now how about question two? Did anyone sketch a graph of this one? When you graph on a graphing calculator, by the way, you don't always see the asymptotes very well. Okay. 
um, they just don't show up that nicely. Here, I'm going to try this. Y equals, oh, by the way, first thing to notice, when you graph a rational function with the graph and calculator, parentheses are very important. I like to put them around the numerator and also around the denominator. Otherwise, it won't know what, what you really want to divide. Okay? It'll just take three divided by stuff otherwise. You guys with me? Okay. So I'd love to sketch a graph, and I'll just do zoom standard for now, because I haven't really thought about it much. That's actually not bad. Although I can't see very much. When your calculator graphs a function, a lot of times, at least mine because it's a TI-83, about 10 years old, it figures, hey, you probably are graphing a continuous function. Now, again, I haven't explained that because I'm not in a calculus class, but I did explain that that means I could draw it without picking up my pen. Can I do that with this function? No, why not? Yeah. See, remember the first thing to think about is the domain. What's the domain of G? Well, what is X not allowed to eat? X is not allowed to equal 5. So we would say the domain goes from negative infinity to 5 in union with 5 to infinity, right? So then what's this line here? Well, this is the calculator graphing some things and then thinking, oh, my gosh, i got to get up there. So it goes way high, and then it starts graphing here, okay? And it drew that line along the way, and that kind of looks like my what? My asymptote, okay? So my asymptote here, my vertical asymptote, is where? At 5, right? So the equation would actually be x equals 5. Now, how do I know I'm going to have a vertical asymptote and not just a hole in the graph? Well, one thing you can do is you can actually try to substitute in g of 5 and see what you get. Well, the denominator is 0, so we know that it's really undefined. But in the numerator, what do I get, 23? I get 23. So... The point is, I get something that's non-zero, okay? If you get something non-zero over something that's zero, that's an indication you, we have a vertical asymptote. It's when I get zero over zero that I'm not sure what's going to happen. I may have to look for this hole in the graph kind of thing. Go ahead, Jack. Uh, don't you only get a hole when something cancels out? Like that's right. That's right. See, Something will cancel out when I get this 0 over 0 happening, or may cancel out. Here, nothing's going to cancel out. There's nothing I could factor that's going to um, help me with that. Okay, so I said I want to sketch a graph, right? The other thing I'd like to graph is I'd like to graph the horizontal asymptote, okay? And remember, when we talk about horizontal asymptotes, okay, so... Here's number one. I'm done with that. But here's number two. When I talk about horizontal asymptotes, ah, asymptote, what I'm really talking about is end behavior. And so I want to think about two situations. I think first I'm going to think about what happens as x goes to infinity. So as x goes to infinity, what happens to g of x? Okay. Well, this is where it's helpful to just take some big numbers. My favorite big number is 1,000. All right? So say I want to compute g of 1,000. Can you do that without a calculator, without pen and paper? Well, almost. I mean, what's the numerator if x is 1,000? 4,003. 
And what's the denominator? Well, it's about 1,000. So I have about 4,000 divided by about 1,000. What's that equal? Something pretty close to what? Four. Same thing if you put in millions. If you have a million and three over about a million, you're actually even closer to four. Okay? This is one way to get the asymptote using what we call number sense. We'll have better ways in a calculus class, but, but this does it. I mean, as x goes to infinity, g of x is approaching what value? Well, again, put in a large number. 10. 10 is a large number. I get 40 over 10. That's not large enough. But it's going to approach 4. Are you guys with me? I don't know. But let's say I want to sketch a graph. Okay? Well, here's what I can do now. So I need um, the x-axis and the y-axis. And I need to sketch asymptotes. And so I'm going to sketch a vertical asymptote at x equals 5. x equals 5. Oh, you can't quite see that, so I'll slide that up. And now the horizontal asymptote we said is at, well, g of x approaches 4. So the horizontal asymptote would be at y equals 4. y equals 4. Okay? And now if I want to graph the rest of it, um, it just comes down to graphing a few points, I think. Okay? So let me plot a few inputs and outputs with the function. Again, I have x, and then I have, well, g of x, which is 4x plus 3 over x minus 5. And so one thing I like to do, for instance, is plug in 0. That's going to give me one of the intercepts. Which kind of intercept is that going to give me if I put in x equals 0? That's the y-intercept. So let's see what we get. What will we get? Looks like we get... Um, well, if I put zeros in for the x's, it looks to me like I'm going to get 3 over negative 5, right? And that's negative 0.6. And so a little bit more than a half right there, that's where the y-intercept is. Hmm. I could plug in other values, right? I could put in a 1 or a 2. Let me ask you this. If I put a 0 in for y, this is how I find the zeros or x-intercepts. Do you guys know how I would get this value? What x is? Well, I have to solve an equation, don't I? What's the equation I need to solve? 4x plus 3 over x minus 5 equals 0. But what Jack said is, forget about which part of this. Forget about the x minus 5. We just need 4x plus 3 to equal 0. How do you make a fraction equal to 0? You make the numerator equal to 0. How do you make a fraction undefined? you make the denominator equal to zero. So these are two nice facts to know when you're studying this chapter. And so I get x equals, I guess, um, what do I get? Negative three-fourths. Negative three-fourths. Hmm. I just noticed that I said the y-intercept was negative 0.6, but I put the dot up at positive 0.6. Do you guys see that? should be down here. Here's negative 1, negative 2. That, that y-intercept should be down here. And then the x-intercept's at negative 3, 4. So I'm going to graph it in red. The graph looks something like this. 
And this one up here, well, we only saw a little piece of it, but if you were to graph more of it, it, it eventually it becomes asymptotic to those lines. So again, on the graphing calculator, I only saw a little piece of it. Okay. Mitch. For a rational function, yeah, those are those are pretty important um, characteristics that we're going to have when we graph a rational function. I guess number one shows you you don't always have them. But most of the time, more often than not, you will, okay? I'm, I'm going to finish up by graphing number three for you, but I'm going to get a separate sheet because this is getting pretty messy. Okay, so number three, we have this function h of x, right? And, and so I want to start by thinking about the domain. So what's my domain? Anything but negative 3, right? So the domain, I guess, is negative infinity to negative 3 union, negative 3 to infinity. Okay. And now, let's see. Well, let's graph a few things. So, oh, do I have a vertical asymptote at negative 3? Well, let me do this. H of negative 3. I know the denominator is 0. Why am I doing this? I'm going to check and see what happens up here in the numerator, right? How would you know if you have an asymptote? If it doesn't equal 0. Now, if it equals 0, then I have to look for a hole in the graph, right? So I get 0 here, and this is non-zero. Yeah, that's something that I can't put in for x. That's right. Well, I put the negative 3 in there, in there, and in the denominator, right? Because it's not in the domain. And since this is non-zero, I'm thinking I'm going to have a vertical asymptote at x equals what? Negative 3. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you next that when I want to think about horizontal asymptotes, that's talking about end behavior. So as x goes to infinity, right? Okay, let's put in a big number, like 1,000. When I put in 1,000, h of 1,000 is approximately what? Well, the denominator is 1,000, 1,003. But again, the 3 doesn't really matter very much, does it? If you're dividing by 1,000, dividing by 1,003 doesn't matter. Anymore. But what about the numerator? Well, the numerator would be, what's 1,000 squared? It's a million. So I'm going to have... 4 million over 1,000. You know what that is? Big. Okay. Well, it is. What if I have H of 1 million? Well, then the denominator is 1 million. Do you guys know what a million squared is? Twelve zeros. That's a trillion, yeah. So I'd have four trillion over one million. This is bigger. All right? This is not the situation where you get a horizontal asymptote. Are you with me? Now, I should have known right away. How can I tell just by looking at the function that this is going to happen? Go ahead, Mitch. Yeah, you have a degree in the numerator higher than the degree in the denominator. When that happens, guys, we're not going to have a horizontal asymptote of any kind. Okay? 
Whereas in number two, the degrees are the same. That's where we did have a horizontal asymptote. That's what you want to look for in these problems. And as you check the homework that you were working on for the start of chapter four, you'll, you'll see. Oh, okay. Um, what else do I want to talk about? Well, okay, so I guess I'll say that this tells me there is no horizontal asymptote. Okay. Now, in fact, what I'll say next is there is something called a slant asymptote. or diagonal asymptote. There is a slant asymptote or diagonal asymptote, depending what you want to call it. And to see that, what you have to notice is that the degree is exactly one higher in the numerator than it is in the denominator. And the trick is to divide, well, 4x squared plus 7x divided by what? The that's what the bar means, right? It means divide. We're going to divide x plus 3. And if you work this out, something really nice happens. Okay, so let's work it out. I say what times x is 4x squared? 4x. 4x, right? I don't need the plus. 4x times x plus 3 is 4x squared plus 12x. You guys with me? Okay, what do I do next? Yeah, because I'm going to be subtracting. So instead, when I draw my line, I change these signs, and now I can just add, like I do in synthetic division. And I get negative 5x right there. And normally what you would do is you would bring down the rest of the polynomial, like a plus 0. There is no constant term for this polynomial. But normally you would bring that down. And then what's the next thing you would do? You'd say, well, what times x is negative 5x? And that would be what? Minus 5. So that's minus 5, okay? And now I have negative 5 times x plus 3. I get negative 5x minus 15. When I draw my line, then I change these signs, and that tells me my remainder is going to be what? 15. And by the way, everything I just did, we could have done with synthetic division. But on some of the homework problems tonight, you're going to have to use long division when the polynomials are bigger. So that's why I wanted to kind of walk through another example. All right. What did we just do? Well, let me show you. Remember, what I have here is I have an equation for h of x h of x is equal to, eh, what the heck is it? Well, it's 4x squared minus se or plus 7x divided by x plus 3. But what I just did is I figured out another way to write it. And the other way to write it is this. Isn't it true that this equals... 4x minus 5? Well, no, that's not quite true. Isn't that almost true? Why is it not true? There's a remainder of 15. But what you can do is, you could say it equals this plus 15 over what? This is the 15 that never got divided by the x plus 3. Okay? 
So what I just wrote in black is another way to write the function h. That's very powerful. Okay? Here. I'm going to go graph the function h, first of all. So it's 4x squared plus 7x <coughs> divided by x plus 3. Okay? And I'm going to go ahead and just sketch a graph. There's my, there's my x inter intercept at negative 3. Now, you can't see the whole function here because it's hard to really see the slant asymptote. And I'm going to actually zoom out so we can say, take a little bit better look at it. And I'm also going to put it up here so you can actually see what I'm doing. No, that's not helpful. Hmm. <laughs> I'll go back to the standard zoom. You see that curve? That curve is part of this graph. Now, how do I graph this function? I'll show you um, up above. So, I like to sketch the intercepts first. Here is the xy plane. What intercepts do we know about? I'm sorry, what asymptotes do we know about? That's what I like to sketch first. Vertical asymptote where? Okay, so we're going to go over to negative 3, and we're going to sketch this line right here. That's the line x equals negative 3. And now, to understand why we have a slant asymptote, you have to look at the way I wrote h of x there at the bottom of the screen. h of x is equal to 4x minus 5 plus ugly. All right? Now, ugly is whatever it is. But let me say one thing about ugly. As x gets big, when you put in 1,000 for x, what happens to this ugly fraction? What does it equal? Well, 15 divided by 1,000, you know what that is? Really small. A million for x? Even smaller. Are you with me? When x gets really big, h of x is pretty much the line 4x minus 5. And so what I do is I graph the line y equals 4x minus 5. Of course, that has a y-intercept of negative 5, and the slope is 4. So if I keep going up 4 and over 1, I'll have an idea of what the line looks like, okay? And so this line here is called my slant asymptote. Now, that's not the best picture in the world. It's okay. Let me draw another view of it here where I actually kind of zoom out. If I were to zoom out, the one asymptote, the blue one, would be at x equals negative 3. And then the black one, the slant asymptote, well, looks kind of like this. Something like that. The lines do cross. Do you see they're going to cross somewhere? Okay way down below. And so now the last thing to do is to actually graph h of x. So let's find some values that are, are good values. By the way, my favorite one to do, first of all, is the, the intercepts. So for example, what is h of 0? Well, isn't it uh, 0 over 3, which is 0? h of 0 is 0. What's that mean? Well, that means on the graph, this thing goes right through 0, 0, right? Right there and right there, depending on which view you're talking about. You guys with me? Now, look at the calculator's picture. You can see it also goes right through 0, 0. You guys see that? So I can kind of mirror the calculator's picture here. It gets closer and closer to the asymptote. Comes down somewhere, and then it comes back up. Looks to me it goes through, like, somewhere around 2. 
How would I figure out exactly where the other x-intercept is? Hmm. Well, we need to, we need to set, here's my equation, right? We need to set h of x equal to 0. 4x squared plus 7x over x plus 3. Now, how do I make a rational function equal to 0? You make which part equal to 0? The top, the numerator. So all I really have to do, guys, is solve 4x squared plus 7x equals 0. So I'll factor out x. Okay. So I can see now what's going on. Either x is 0, or the other answer is x is what? Negative 7 fourths. And that's why it's not almost 2. Yeah, it's almost negative 2. That's approximately what that picture looks like. Okay. Now, if you were to graph the whole thing, looks like this. Looks like this. And there is another piece of the graph down here. Okay? There's another piece down there. Well, because you can put in values to the left of negative 3. Here, let me show you. Okay? And, and this is where the software can be helpful. I don't see the other piece of the graph right now, right? Have you guys seen the table feature of this? The online one has this too. If I hit second graph, it makes a little table for me. Okay? And so it can tell you for different x values what the y values are. But let me go back a little bit to the negative values. Okay, well, check this out, first of all, which is kind of cool. Look what it says for negative 3. Why is that? Because that would make the denominator 0. That's not a lot. But look at these values over here, negative 4, negative 5, negative 6. You see those? You can see there is more to the graph. And what I'm going to tell you is it, it looks a lot like this because it has to be asymptotic. You guys follow? A lot. 